I'm Edie Lush, and I'm here at the Hub Pavilion in Davos. Very pleased now to be joined by Ian Cheshire, Hello. Group Chief Executive for Kingfisher. Thanks mm -hmm. for coming along. We've been talking to a bunch of CEOs here mm -hmm. in Davos about sustainability, and I know that this is one of the um, big challenges yep. uh, for Kingfisher, so maybe you could tell me a little bit about what your thinking is now. Great. Well, we've had a long tradition from our time at B&Q uh, of an interest, which started with some, one of our customers actually asking us, well, where does your wood come from for, to make your garden furniture? To which the answer was, well, we don't know, but we better find out. And that led us on a journey through to being a co-founder of the FSC and then a whole set of campaigns around, for example, taking uh, volatile com compounds out of paint. And really what we're now trying to look at is what's the next generation of sustainability for us. And while we're doing loads of things which I would describe as business as usual, so yes, we want to cut our emissions, yes, we want to be more effective about our waste, We've identified sort of four areas where we think we can really focus because we, we are, <clears throat> I suppose, globally significant. So timber is still very much one. Mm -hmm. We're about 97%, and I think now, either certified or, or, or chain of custody would. And we think that that's really important to keep pushing, particularly mm -hmm. we're pushing against illegal timber in the, U in the EU. Second area is the opportunity around energy efficiency, which is the obvious thing to do in the first step. Mm -hmm. Actually, surprisingly, how few people have still not insulated their loft, and, yep. and obviously we sell that product, and we're also interested in our own energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. Third area was we're looking at is more radical product design, because we are an 11 billion pound business. Uh, we're actually the largest player probably in home improvement in, in the world outside the U US. We're actually a lot bigger than some of our suppliers, so we're actually stepping into the innovation gap and saying, how do we design products that you can genuinely, from beginning to end, think mm -hmm. about their life cycle, so that they're in components that you can recycle easily and that they, you can maybe turn from being a retailer of a product to sort of the guardian of a value chain that evolves. So we're just beginning to, to, to really try and develop that. And the last bit is communities, because we are everywhere, 840, 840 stores around the world. We are a local-based um, operation. 80% of our customers come from 20, 20 minutes away. Mm -hmm. So we have a, a tremendous footprint to have an impact on our local communities, and we're trying to figure out where are the areas we can be really helpful and, and frankly, have our, our right to continue uh, trading in those communities. And I know that you've, um, you've got an operations off over the world. Mm -hmm. I, I see from, from your uh, plans for the, the coming years that doing something with your turning around your business in China. Can you yeah. tell me a little bit through that? Yeah, we, we have most of our businesses, we are sort of 40% UK, 40% France, 20% rest of the world, mm -hmm. which is mostly Eastern Europe, uh, including Poland, Russia, Turkey. And we're operating in China, where we have 41 stores now. We are the largest organized retail player in our sector, but we've had a, a really tough two years of reorganizing our business. Um, when I took over three years ago, we were losing about 50 million pounds, and we should break even next year. So the priority was get the business fixed uh, to start with. We now think there are opportunities. It's a very different market in China because it's not a DIY mm -hmm. market. It is uh, much more about home improvement, helping people um, fix their homes up through uh, other people doing the work. Mm -hmm. But there's a huge market there. And we think we're just beginning to get to the point where we've got a model that will, will hopefully give us uh, many years of growth in China. And is IP a concern for you in, in China? Um, it will become more of a concern. Um, we actually feature it the other way around, which is that one of the things we do in our stores in China is we feature products and show people fakes mm -hmm. and show people the real things and, because there is a continual issue with that. And we found that some of our, um, one, about 40% of our business, we actually fit out people's apartments and flats from a concrete shell. So mm -hmm. we don't, we actually do it for them rather than do it ourselves. We found some of our workmen were making more money by selling the empty pots of Dulux paint <laughs> to forgers than they were from us paying them to, to, to actually do the painting. So right. forgery and IP is, is an issue there. But mm -hmm. actually, we, in a weird way, I think for our market, it's an opportunity to say, look, here's the quality you can actually count on. It's real stuff. And some of the horror stories you hear about fake products in China, um, customers are, are pretty switched on about it. Fantastic. Ian, thanks very much for coming into the Hub Pavilion here in Davos. A great pleasure. <laughs> Thank thanks you very much. much. I'm Edie Lush.